Hello and welcome to the panel Strategies of Global Solidarity in the Face of Multiple Crises. Yes, I feel very honored to moderate the session today as it focuses on activism in the global north and in the global south. Um, having a background in African studies and Latin American studies and researching on environmental activism, mostly in South Africa, but also in Vienna, from my perspective, it is very important to perceive global divisions and boundaries. So to introduce myself quickly, my name is Antje Daniel. I'm visiting professor of development studies at the Institute of Development Studies at Vienna University. And it is really a great pleasure uh, to lead you through the session. First of all, I would like to um, mention that there is a translation of the session and please go to the Discord forum. The link to the Discord forum will be copy-pasted in the chat mode. Und nochmal ganz kurz auf Deutsch für all diejenigen, die eine Übersetzung brauchen. Es wird gleich sozusagen ein Link gesetzt in den Chatforum, wo ihr problemlos dann zu der Übersetzung kommt. The chat mode can also be used for questions and answer in the last part of the session. I want to thank Max for his great assistance to organize and to conduct this panel. Thank you very much, Max. The session will be a live session. If the Wi-Fi connection will be not that good, maybe we have to switch to the pre-recorded statements. And actually, we decided now to have a combination between two pre-recorded uh, statements of the panelists and two live statements of the panelists. The session will be a combination of these different statements. In the second part, we will comment on each other and the panelists will get the possibility to react on the other contributions. And in the last part, we will have a Q&A session. The overall aim of the panel is to stimulate exchange between the global south and north on socio-ecological transformation and solidarity. As we all know, when we are talking about the global south and the global north, we use the notions as constructed geographical areas, which are used to highlight hierarchies and power relations and even to refer to different epistemologies and ontologies. We are all aware that countries of the so-called Global South have undergone very different social, political and economic developments. Due to the different histories, it is also important to question generalized meanings and concepts which we are using in the North. John Kamarov and John Kamarov argue, and now I'm quoting, Western Enlightenment thought has, from the first posited itself as the wellspring of universal learning. Therefore, we have to contest the universality of concepts which we are using for describing environmental struggles and socio-ecological transformation in order to prove them if we can apply them to global south. Many concepts exist which also came from the global south. The development nexus still plays a fundamental role because values and norms of development policies are part of the social reality of different social actors and will persist. Beyond the development nexus, multiple partly overlapping alternative visions of the future circulate. For instance, post-development and degrowth highlight the role of alternative developments beyond modernity and capitalism. Concepts such as Buen Vivir, Vida Tanquia in Latin America or Ubuntu in South Africa or Ujamaa in Tanzania illustrate a broad range of conceptions for an alternative future. Particularly in Africa, also concepts such as Afro-Turkia, Afro-Futurism or African Renaissance describe the need and the urgency to reflect about alternative futures. Because alternative futures are always embedded in north-south relations, Arturo Escobar argues 
that it is important to bridge north-south relations and tensions, particularly in the debate on degrowth. He argues that we have to overcome narrative such as the North needs degrowth while the South needs development. With the aim to understand future aspirations in the global South and in the face of multiple crises, we ask our panelists for statements about the respective interweaving of multiple crises as they observe and whether this crisis provoked the emergence of activism and the development of an alternative future. We are also curious to know if and how these actors relate to existing concepts such as post-development or degrowth, and if the meaning differ in the North and in the South. And due to the fact that North-South relations shape future aspirations, we want to know if and what form of transnational solidarities emerge. It is really an honor and a great pleasure to discuss all those questions with Marga Milan, Godwin Oji Orge, Emi Itwin, and Alexander Beer. I will introduce you to the panelists before I will hand over to the speaker. Marga Milan is a sociologist with background in anthropology, and she works at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Her research focuses is on uh, social movements and prefiguration of the political, mainly the Zapatistas in Mexico. She also worked a lot on gender issues and gender representation and on decolonial critique and critique of the economic paradigm. Godwin Oji Ojo is executive director and is one of the co-founder of environmental rights Action and Friends of the Earth Nigeria, which was founded in 1993 for the protection of the environment and the democratization of development. Godwin is a political ecologist, activist and researcher and one of the most important environmental activists and advocates in Nigeria. He has gained several awards and wrote a lot of interesting articles. Ime Itwin is a social scientist, human rights and climate activist. She studied social sciences and integrated natural resource management in Berlin and Australia and is particularly interested in racism and colonial continuities in the climate crisis. Ime is part of the so-called Black Indigenous People of Color Environmental and Justice Coalition, Black Earth, she wrote many amazing articles, such as on environmental colonialism. Part of our panel is also Alexander Beer. He is a political scientist, translator and journalist. He teaches at different universities and schools. And he is an activist, for instance, in the network Africa Europe Interact and Forum Civic Org. And he also wrote a lot of amazing articles in Global Solidarity, for instance. Thank you for all your contributions to our panel. We are really excited that you share our thoughts with us. And now I will open the floor for you and for our first input. And therefore, I will hand over to Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, and thank you to all the organizers. And I'm very happy to be here with all these valuable colleagues and very excited to, to have this exchange. So I, I will start um, um, speaking about how, how I feel this contemporary crisis. Um, I think this is a global, multidimensional uh, crisis that we have been living not only now but it has some some decades and it compromises the political the economic the social the cultural dimensions the subjectivity also the way we live the way we consume the way we produce so is the crisis of capitalism as not only a mode of production but a civilizational mode of living and understanding life 
and uh, evaluating priorities and organizing priorities. So neoliberalism has driven to a radical extreme all this that was already um, present. And global pandemic in which we're living now emphasizes and amplifies what in the flow of normality remain silent or repressed or even criminalized. So I subscribe to the perspective that we inhabit this civilizational crisis and also that we are in a moment of danger, as Walter Benjamin says, a moment of uncertainty in which many forces are in collision and it is not clear if humanity will be able to overcome patriarchal capitalism and imperialist colonialism, or if we will insist that this is the only possible world. But the integrality of the crisis also opens fruitful insights. Social movements are connecting dots between the multi-components of each particular crisis. In Latin America, in, I'm going to talk now about what, what kind of movements I think um, enables this, the sensibility to climate change and to environmental crisis. Um, in Latin America, in the last two decades of the 21st century, we had the presence of what we call the struggles in defense of the territory, uh, that we can also refer to them as social environmental conflicts. But I think that in order to understand and be able to dialogue from north, south with these movements, we have to trace the meaning of this uh, classification in our states that are plurinational and pluricultural societies. In these societies, the state formation is built on internal colonialism and even on continuous conquest of the territory and of the life of indigenous people. So internal colonialism, that's a concept, a Latin America critical concept, um, refers to exclusionary cultural processes that works homogenizing different cultures and inheritances of nations without state by the formation of national culture, national state, mainly by education. So this means we support ethnic discrimination and class differentiation in these state formations. So on the struggles in the defense of the territory, we um, find that they mobilize what Arturo Escobar um, calls at ontopolitics, um, meaning the territory is a way of life but this way of life is based on intersubjective relation with the environment, forcing it to prescribe any kind of commodification or merchandise use. So in fact, the territory is alive itself and people belong to this way of life, belong to this territory. So that's why the struggles are so uh, potent because it's not only defending the place of living, but a way of living. And in this way of living, I think we can find a proposal of decreasing uh, production and consumption. So in the context that I describe above, the state policies and the global policies, mainly the corporations that rule what we call economy in in this world are the actors of development, modernization, progress, etc. Um, even within the progressive governments, I want to make this point that we have, uh, you, you may you may know, in the last um, decades, so uh, strong movements that um, take into power to to progressive uh, governments mainly saying that they were non-liberal governments, but uh, yes, they redistribute a lot more of the of the uh, money of the economy. But in the main core of their policies, uh, destructivism was mainly untouched. Even it was greater, uh, with many contradictions. I'm not going to 
to go in this because it's a long discussion. But the point I want to make is that in any kind of government in Latin America we have in the last 40 years, development means for the indigenous people, for the native uh, communities, expropriation of territory, expropriation of their own capacity for political self-determination, extractivism, displacement of population, criminalization of protest, and selective assassination of leaders defending the forest, water, rivers, communal lands, etc. I just want to remember Berta Cáceres and honor her and her uh, struggle. She was uh, murdered on, in March 2016 in Honduras. So I think alternative visions for the future that emerge from these kind of struggles link the care of nature with the care of concrete conditions of reproductions of form of life, culture, and self-government. Ontopolitics is an indigenous communal form of politics. And in all Latin, in Latin America, we can find uh, in, in the practice, in the struggle, in what you call, because I have been looking for some of the panels, these intersectional uh, gestures that make possible not only the resist the resistance the the yes the, the resistance of the capitalist politics but also the capacity to um to put in march and to preserve certain kind of relationship um so what i think is new is the link that uh, we start to make and to promote from these kind of pers perspectives and the struggle it makes uh, in front of capitalist uh, development with another kind of struggles. Um, so the realm of social ecological change is envisioned indeed also by the women's movement in Latin America. This is a movement that has been combining, I mean, intersecting a plurality of local struggles that go from reproductive rights to anti-extractivism. <clears throat> I want to make, to post the thing, the, <clears throat> the idea that the metaphor of body as territory has also worked in reverse, territory as body, starting the formation of a multidimensional movement that defines against patriarchy, capitalism, also colonialism and productivism. In Mexico, it has been reinforced by the active participation of the Zapatistas uh, that provided a encounters, women encounters, international women encounters. And this was like a melting pot of um, many women in struggle and many kind of feminism. Um, it's like a laboratory of mixes and anti-systemic formation. I want to underline that. Uh, subjectivity and politically anti-systemic formation. So just before the lockdown, we were on the streets making the articulation of patriarchy and capitalism. Uh, vividly in a performative way. I don't know if you saw this intervention of a rapist on your way. Uh, so the appropriation of this gesture, for example, the anti-patriarchalism by the indigenous woman is, is a fantastic link with, uh, within rural and uh, urban, for example, and between um, intergenerations intergener uh, also um, discussion. So I find in this movement and in the struggles uh, to defend the territory, an intersectional praxis that is very, very potent and that we would have to promote in the, uh, in the links between North and South. So even though the growth language, the growth positioning academically or theoretical, uh, we don't uh, listen too much in the movements. I think in the women movement is clear that it is uh, talked, it is um, appropriate by putting the social reproduction in the center, uh, the economy of care, the possibility of reproduction of the conditions of life, 
this, this, uh, the, to mainstream the qualitative needs of human and nature, of life uh, in general, at the central point. So to prioritize the local scale, the community health, the community knowledge, the collective organization, uh, but also in this part of potential of the local, go regional and go translocal. So um, to begin closing, the futures these new movements aspire to are, I think, intensively democratized, willing to govern themselves rather than, than being governed, non-heteropatriarchal, decolonized, and radically anti-capitalist. Paradoxically, the lockdown and the social distance has opened an extraordinary time of discussion and political articulation. Um, we, we now are discussing all of, with people all over the world. Although these movements are not theoretically or politically ascribed to the growth and post-development, they practice and the, the horizon of their, of their direction, I think, is in the same way. However, the key words that mobilize us are, for example, dignified life, social justice, a re-enchanted vision of nature, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist uh, politics, relation between North and South. So the key question of transnational solidarity is emerging. I think it has to Mm, it's very linked with the strategies, and I think that um, um, talking about the struggle um, defending the territory, the strategies must be not only local but intertwine with the north, because the most of the corporations, the 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 capital invested in the south comes from. For example, in my country, all, all the wind industry comes from uh, Italy, Spain, uh, United States, for example. Um, so if we could link these movements, if we could act as one whole, uh, uh, rejecting this kind of intervention, it, both in the place, in the land that is uh, resisting, but also in in the place where the corporations are uh, making their decisions, I think this will be uh, something new. I think this. I think we could do that. So um, no one of no one of no one of all has no one has all the answers to the challenges we are facing. We are all in need of the others to make possible another world, and no way back to normality. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marga, for this really amazing contribution. Um, I liked it that you really referred also to the particularities of the indigenous and the feminist struggles in Mexico, um, but you should and argued also how important it is to have something like a global solidarity. Thank you very much. So our next talk, um, our next talk will be uh, from Godwin, and um, Godwin will not speak live, but we will hear his pre-recording. Hello, my name is Godwin Uyoju, Director of Environmental Rights Action, Friends of the Earth, Nigeria. Thanks for having me. Uh, just to start by stating that from research and statistics on the geography of global wealth distribution, uh, it is getting clear by the day that a major challenge is the crisis of, a, of our exploitation of natural resources uh, from the global south uh, to the global north. And this in itself uh, has led to serious environmental degradation on the and of violent global resource conflicts at the site of extraction. So the international oil companies uh, operate with impunity. Uh, that 
and that is why there's over, of consistent exploitation persistent environmental of natural resources uh, from the global south uh, to the global north uh, and this in itself uh, has led to serious I'm really sorry we had some technical issues with the um, video again like I don't know what's uh, the issue there's some technical project problems Godwin could you maybe speak live is your internet connection okay um Okay, the pre-recording doesn't work very well, so we will try to have Godwin live, if possible. Um, Godwin, are you with us? Yes. Okay, um, sorry for a slight uh, internet uh, situation, uh, but the issue about North-South, um, has been a long drawn out debate and it's about over exploitation of natural resources uh, from the global south to the global north that is leading to environmental degradation in a monumental scale uh, and also resulting in violent resource conflicts at the site of extraction. So we are looking at issues of over exploitation in the global south leading to over consumption uh, in the global north. Uh, what is critical about all this uh, is about uh, the privatization of natural resources uh, in terms of how uh, resources are used on a global scale. Uh, we, we have issues of privatization of our, our water, our food, our energy systems, uh, and, and this is leading to serious uh, impoverishment uh, in the global south. Uh, we have issue of, in terms of environmental management, there are serious issues of international oil companies, for example, uh, how they conduct environmental management. Uh, and we simply can see it in terms of environmental racism uh, in the sense that the standards uh, they deploy uh, in the industrialized uh, global north uh, is different from the standards that is deployed in global south. So there's kind of double standards uh, and that in itself uh, has come to uh, define the environment of the global south uh, which leads to impoverishment. Uh, we have issues that have been played out in many settings and uh, uh, sometimes is trampled upon at uh, the issue of ecological debt uh, resulting from unequal exchange of goods and services. Uh, simply that this, the South has consistently uh, been the centers of primary producers uh, of goods and services uh, to the north that then dictate the price uh, and, and, and then turn it around as finished products and, and dumping ground in the south. So these are critical issues uh, that has uh, taken root uh, in the development uh, discourse. But what we want to say is that we are also having alternative visions. And I am one of those that championed the concept of decarbonization, decarbonization of the economy, uh, which is uh, which we started in Nigeria uh, as the concept of leave the oil in the soil. Uh, we strongly believe for a decarbonized economy uh, in ways that will lead to just transition. So, in terms of energy, we are already looking at energy transition that we allow individuals, communities, 
uh, energy cooperatives uh, to be co-producers as well as co-suppliers of energy uh, in ways that reduces the current hegemonic system, monopolistic tendencies of the current energy system that we allow communities and individuals to be co-producers and suppliers in ways that they share responsibilities as well as benefits that are accruing. Uh, so this concept of energy democracy uh, simply calls for a decentralized energy system away from the present system uh, that we are having. Uh, we, we also have uh, an issue of leaving the oil in the soil and uh, not just leaving it in the soil, the, the whole issue of unequal exchange of natural resources uh, uh, that leads to overconsumption in the North needs to be addressed. Uh, and, and we simply, by this we state that energy consumption, the consumption of the common resources, uh, the way they are being used uh, is far more uh, skewed to the advantage of the North uh, in comparison to the global South. So these issues are very fresh and we look at the ways that we see, for example, the oil companies and what they do. Uh, they, sometimes they are just mere extension of what we can call uh, a colonial uh, colonial masters. Uh, so it's new colonialism that is at play. Uh, and this is why we seriously uh, uh, support and work towards the notion of decolonization. Decolonization of the development process, decolonization of the way we rationalize uh, the GDP, for example, and the foreign direct investment that my first speaker spoke about uh, it's also very clear. Development is being measured in Nigeria, for example, uh, with, the, with the, 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 the scope and volume of foreign direct investment you can attract to the country. Uh, and that literally is leading to uh, massive impoverishment, it's leading to land grabbing, it's leading to all sorts of violence uh, that is making life difficult uh, in the global south. So we want to also talk about uh, the mode of production uh, and the mode of consumption that I've been talking about. We are simply saying that the agribusiness, the way it is currently framed, uh, also uh, negates North-South relations uh, in the sense that the agribusiness uh, provides a means of false narrative for example, that the South, especially Africa, the question is, can Africa feed itself? And we've seen tendencies after tendency that seems to suggest that Africa cannot feed itself. But the reality is that Africa can feed itself. But you need this narrative in order to promote big business, agro industries, in ways that then displace the small scale farm holders who are practicing what we call agroecology, a farming system that is in tune, in line with environmental consideration. So these are some of the things we are bringing forward uh, as part of the alternative vision uh, that we have. Uh, we can see that the issue of decolonization, the issue of decentralization resonates well uh, as part of the, the growth uh, debate. But within the mainstream, uh, I will speak for Africa to some extent, I will speak for Nigeria to some extent for Africa, and to say that within the mainstream of development, the concept of the growth is only just emerging. Uh, it's, it has hardly found any place in governmental discourse. But actors, civil society and social actors are beginning to embrace this concept in ways that can bring about uh, a dialogue between North-South that will help to erase some of this uh, Eurocentric mode of development. So the global solidarity that is going on at the moment, uh, they are very interesting. 
It's about linking local struggles uh, to international contest. So we are building strong grassroots national uh, movements to link up with the various uh, social movements that are engaged in the issues that we talk about, energy democracy, decentralization, uh, decolonization. So this concept, just energy transition and just transition itself. So these broad frames uh, is what constitute part of the social movement uh, that we are talking about. Um, COVID-19 is very much in the lips of everybody. Uh, but I, what I will say there is that uh, the conspiracy theories are huge and there are many. And I'm trying to follow a, a few of them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your great presentation and even that you that the internet was stable and that you spontaneously gave us your talk. Um, thank you very much. I think it was a great illustration how global relations play out in Nigeria and um, which constraints also Nigeria faces. Um, and I think um, the next presenter, Ime, can also relate to global relations and um, global forms or how international structures play out. So I would like to hand over to Imi for the next live presentation. Okay, thank you, Antia. And I'm also glad it worked out for Godwin because I would have very much disliked to, to miss that wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, I was asked to speak on global solidarity from a black activist perspective in the global north. Um, and as part of a BPOC, so black indigenous people of color, collective. We fight for justice for our families in the global south. We fight um, for or rather against racist aggressions and policing in the global north and we fight against racist migration politics at the European borders and within. And um, we are reminded painfully, especially as of now, um, every day that our lives do not matter the same and um, not in the global north and especially not in the global south. Um, in the West, but not of the West. That is what best describes the Black perspective or the Black experience in the West. Um, no matter what the crisis, Black, Indigenous and POC communities are always first and worst hit. Um, but of course, on a global scale, um, for more than 500 years, since 1452 to be exact, the Global South has been the ultimate sacrifice zone. The entire and continuing history of colonial power and violence has meant that the Global South is burdened with the most toxic and the most deadly externalities of Western modes of production and consumption. Um, when it comes to deaths in the Global South, we don't even see single bodies. We don't even hear names and we don't hear from the families of the deceased. Whether dead or alive, we see masses of bodies on boats in the Mediterranean or buried alive under, under collapsed factories or in mines. The wealth of the global north <laughs> that us based in the global north see every day um, was built on slavery and colonialism. Yet those essential to building this wealth were always treated as disposable, anonymous masses um, and the essentialism was always denied. When um, we in the Global North, and I, I include myself here, we've become far too accustomed to an economic system and a social hierarchy based on the sacrifice of life, which renders so many ecologies and so many peoples, especially in the Global South, um, disposable. While we in the Global North are slowly returning to a normal that obviously we are um, aware is, is a crisis in itself, um, but we are still in it going to be in a global pandemic when the rainy season starts in, in most parts of the global south. And with that, um, many people will face extreme weather events like storms and floods, which further threaten people's lives and livelihoods. The global north is the producer of so many crises in, uh, that the global south is facing today. 
And the usual condition here is to ignore this hardship and especially to ignore this causal relationship without any compassion for uh, people in the global south. To end this unjust and extractive relationship, the global north must go through social ecological transformation. There's no doubt about that. But without degrowth and anti-racism and anti-colonialism at its heart, transforming the global now north will ignite a new wave of devastation and an extraction. Um, as my previous speakers have already pointed out, um, there's a likelihood that instead of oil, there will be lithium, bauxite, and cobalt um, will be the next natural resources that will be detrimental in determining whether people can keep the rights to their territories, to their lands, to their health, culture, and well-being intact. The term coloniality um, describes the extractivist relationship of coercion, not as a historical moment, like some time, some point back in time, but as a set of relations that continue until today. And we cannot understand the suffering and struggles of people in the global south, of formerly colonized people, outside of this context of colonial and extractivist history. For example, we cannot understand why uh, the state, or we cannot understand the state of the public health sector in most countries of the global south without awareness of the so-called structural development programs imposed in the 1970s by the World Bank and the IMF that systematically waged war and ravaged health services in many countries of the global south. It is often said that Germany's and the EU's financial power come with responsibility, um, but it is not only that Germany has more money. Uh, as Godwin already said, if we look at where this money comes from, we can see that there's a large amount of debt to, attached to it. And in the midst of uh, this pandemic, we can already see a massive um, flight of capital from the, uh, from the global south. The economic impact of the crisis is threatening to kill more people even than the virus itself. Canceling debts has always been uh, the right thing to do, but it is definitely an, an imperative now. And in, instead of thinking of it as philanthropy or as charity, we should think of it as just redistribution of wealth or just, as Godwin said, reparations. Um, yeah, looking deeper into this century old history of inequality and injustice, is, is painful, and I think it should be painful for all of us. But we need to look and understand really these, what created these conditions for these crises um, to build meaningful solidarity and to establish meaningful cooperation that does not follow the old racist paternalistic trajectories. So when we talk about global solidarity, we must recognize that whiteness produces certain US and European centered views about human struggle, about which human, uh, which crisis is most urgent at the moment and about which crisis is supposed to be treated as an emergency. So global solidarity must incorporate more decentering of whiteness and decentering of Westerners. And it must lead to the disorientation and the shift of power. Fighting for transition here in the global north needs to include also transition to justice in the North-South relationship. We, um, as Black Earth, the collective I'm part of, uh, call ourselves an environmental and climate justice collective. Um, yet, as we build our networks, especially with the Global South, but also within, within the Global North, we keep saying that climate is not first, nor is environment for that matter. The climate crisis, biodiversity, biodiversity crisis, racism, sexism, extractivism, poverty, they're all interconnected and we need to tackle them at the same time. That of course is a big task, um, but we're not starting from scratch as we also heard from Magda. Indigenous peoples across the continents have continuously shared and are continuing to share knowledge on holistic ways of living that center life instead of destroying it. And obviously there's a long and strong history of fights in all parts of the world against this oppressive system. So it's time to forge new ways of organizing and bridging distances 
some of which are geographic. <laughs> and in this sense, it's, I find it also very powerful that this talk was able to take place today online. So yeah, thank you very much. I also already see like a red card, but I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for this amazing talk and also that you reminded us this or explained us the origins and the persistence of colonialism and how important it is, is to think about the privilege of whiteness. Um, I find it quite amazing that you said degrowth um, is a precondition or uh, to decoloniality and we're going to discuss all this later on but first of all I would like to hand over to Alexander. Um, actually we planned to have a the, um, to, to have a pre-recording right now but let's see if it works out. If not Alexander hopefully you are prepared for a live talk. Yeah, I want to start now with my input for our common talk, Strategies for Global Solidarity in the Face of Multiple Crises. The title of my input will be, Let us not allow the historical window of opportunity to close again. We cannot let another crisis go waste. My name is Alexander Beer. I'm active in the network Africa Europa Act and Civic. The situation in which we find ourselves could not be more paradoxical. As the pandemic spreads before our eyes, leaders around the globe are suddenly able to make economic decisions that until recently they would have branded as the devils. Trillions of dollars and euros are on the table. The state intervenes in economic affairs without hesitation. The neoliberal dogma that says that the invisible hand of the market is capable of solving all the problems has turned out to be sheer nonsense. What was categorically fought in pre-corona times is currently the anonymous opinion across all ideological camps. The crisis we are facing is no coincidence. It is not, and the activists of the Chinese opposition blog of the magazine Chuang have pointed this out very clearly, it is not an unlikely event that is independent of the capitalist economy. Rather, a direct line from the structural growth constraint of capital, capitalism leads to the COVID crisis. Countless researchers have pointed out in recent weeks that the destruction of biodiversity, the destruction of the forests, etc., enormously increases the likelihood of viruses to spread from wild animals to humans. The feminist Marxist Silvia Federici has described these processes of destruction in her books as the continued primitive accumulation of capital. To the destruction of biodiversity comes the danger posed by industrial livestock breeding that also causes the spread of dangerous viruses. Amongst many others, this has been pointed out by the biologist Rob Wallace, the author of Big Farms Make Big Flu. I think this is a very important book for us right now. The spread of COVID-19 was not accidental either. It was the upper middle class, the very rich, the upper middle class, whose above average number of air journeys took the virus around the globe at a very high speed. The COVID crisis now shows us how important it is to protect natural habitats from the grip of industrial capitalist destruction and to question the dogma of infinite economic growth. But what is to be done right now? What is to be done? Uh, a historic window of opportunity has opened before our eyes, I would argue. It would be fatal to allow it to close again. The economic crisis of 2008 and 2009 was followed by another business as usual. At that time, the global social movements were too weak to implement an alternative 
to neoliberal globalization, even though we saw the Occupy movement, the Arab Spring, etc. emerging. Let us not allow the profound social ecological transformation that we need so urgently to be stopped this time. In view of the rapidly advancing climate destruction, we cannot afford to let another crisis go waste. The slogan of the climate movements for this year was by 2020 we rise up. Mass actions were planned around the globe. Normally thousands of us would now be on the streets to support our demands for climate justice. In Austria, for example, movements such as System Change Not Climate Change or Stay Grounded provide the important impetus. The corona crisis now puts us in a totally paradoxical situation. We cannot gather on the streets in order to block climate damaging sectors such as the car or the aircraft industry by means of civil disobedience, mass civil disobedience. But most of these destructive industries are at a standstill anyway without our intervention. This is no cause for being happy, uh, of course. Countless people are right now suffering from the consequences of the crisis, not only in terms of health, but also in social and economic terms. But suddenly, suddenly right now, we find ourselves at the crossroads in history. We can, and indeed we must, turn the wheel of history in another direction. As Lucia Steinwender emphasized, we must ensure that production conversion is initiated in sectors that are most harmful to the climate. All public investment must be oriented towards meeting the 1.5 degree target of Paris. The gigantic public funds that are now available must be used to offer attractive and well-secured ecological jobs to workers, for example, in the aviation and car industries. Me and Uli Brandt have pointed out that in the case of the aircraft industries, this could be tackled immediately. After all, flying is not only a climate killer that causes almost 15% of emissions in Europe. The plane is also a means of transport that is used far more by the rich than by the poor in Europe and of course uh, on a global scale. It is much more uh, obvious even. Apart from the ecological restructuring of the economy, it is important to share the burdens of the crisis in a just way. We should now not be modest in our demands. We should not be modest in our demands. For there is not only big money on the table. If the progressive forces are able to build up sufficient pressure, the right concepts can be put on the table as well. These include the Green New Deal, as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez proposed it for the US already a year ago, and as Bernie Sanders has adopted it for his election campaign. Instead of bailing out large fossil fuel companies, the large-scale public investment that is now on the table would have to be used to create mass jobs for the expansion of public transport, the dismantling of motorways, we have to get rid of them, and for large-scale building isolation. Additionally, well-secured and attractive jobs in the, in the area of reproduction works, work must be created. Because, after all, care work, care work and the safeguarding of public infrastructure are currently proving more than ever to be those areas of, socia of, society, I'm sorry, of society that are truly systemically relevant. The state should, up, should set up work, foundation, work foundations that provide well-paid and secure jobs and make them accessible. Be it in the sector of care work, local provision of healthy food or public transport. 
Pressure from below must also be built up by us in order to pre prevent fossil energy being replaced by nuclear power in the future. It is also important to avert the emergence of green colonialism with the mining of raw materials such, such as lithium, cobalt or copper, which are important for solar and wind energy and for electric cars. Pressure from below is also important to prevent the reactionary approach to the climate question. In Austria, for example, the Chancellor played off the climate issue against the migration issue with the slogan protect the climate and the borders. We have to stand up against this. Clearly, Antifa for future or Unteilbar for future, Indivisible for future have become popular slogans for the necessary interconnection between climate movements and anti-racist and anti-fascist movements. It is also important to redistribute privileges, be it material privileges or symbolic ones, such as access to the media, the public or political structures. Emmanuel Bolela, whom I have been working with for many years in our network Africa Rob Interact and whose book My Journey from the Congo to Europe I translated from French to German, always stresses in his speeches the need to end neo-colonial oppression in the countries of the global south. For him, this is a clear demand since Patrice Marie Lumumba, who led the fight for freedom in the DRC, was murdered in 1961 with the aid of the Belgium and US military. The COVID crisis has abruptly eroded, in my view, the basis of the imperial mode of production and living. What we can learn from the crisis is that the hamster wheel of wage labor and consumption in which a big part of the population in the global north is locked up and that is so closely related to the exploitation of the global south can be stopped, can be stopped and that we can indeed build up alternatives. One last word, one last word. It is clear that we have to continue to, be, to build up pressure for the immediate evacu evacuation of the, Greek, of the refugee camps on the Greek islands. Because we cannot think about utopias for the post-corona period if the most urgent forms of transnational solidarities, solidarity are not maintained here and now. In a way, this is the litmus test for the society we should build up after Corona. Quarantine might currently restrict our freedom of movement and assembly, but not our ability to speak out loud and clear in favor of global solidarity. Thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to our common debate. So thank you very much, Alexander. I especially like that you highlighted the role of global solidarity in, in the last statement. And um, yes, we are going to start now with the second part of our panel. Um, that means that each panelist has now the possibility to comment each other. Um, and for me, um, hearing your different presentations, I I think it would be quite interesting if you relate your comment to the relation between decoloniality and degrowth. Um, as already some questions came up about the relation between decoloniality and degrowth. And also to relate probably um, to what extent or whether a global solidarity is possible in the um, pandemic situation we have. Okay, um, I would like to ask you to switch your camera and your 
um, mic on and because I see Godwin is already there. Godwin, do you want to start with a comment of three to, two to three minutes? Well, I find the discussion very interesting uh, in the sense that there are a number of commonalities. Uh, uh, I don't want to frame it uh, within the concept of uh, North-South divide or the fight between the North and the Global South, uh, but I would rather uh, point it on issue of decolonization of natural resource uh, management. Uh, the way the mode of production that resonates in the whole of the Global uh, South uh, is something that we need to address. Uh, the way the resources are deployed, whether in Asia or in Latin America or in Africa, uh, is very similar. So we, we should really uh, highlight and bring to the fore uh, the issue of uh, decolonization of, of the development process. Uh, and this simply means bringing in equity, bring, uh, trying to eliminate inequalities in the development process and the use of natural resources that is available uh, to the world. So the privatization of our resources in terms of water, in terms of energy, in terms of the food systems, uh, I think that require a critical, a critical look uh, to ensure that these resources are not just scattered away at the detriment of the people at the site of extraction. There's great violence in Latin America, in Asia, as well as in Nigeria, uh, mm -hmm. because as more and more of these resources are being taken away, uh, it leads to violence at the site of extraction. So th this is a, a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. And then the concept of uh, degrowth uh, is essential. Uh, it's very important uh, as looking at uh, development too. And, and we can even begin to talk about the ecological debt, for example, and the need for reparation. Uh, but much more important, the, the measurement of a country's or a people's well-being through capital by capital income and other uh, uh, human development indicators, uh, we need to transcend those realms uh, and move towards issues of human rights. Uh, issues of equity and wet redistribution. I think my colleagues, uh, the first speaker, second speaker, and the third one, they, they spoke uh, about this as well. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. essential to re-engineer the development process, uh, which I very much agree. Ecological restructuring, the last speaker mentioned that, and uh, that is part of decolonization. So we need mm -hmm. to see how we can live in harmony with nature. Uh, and talking about climate change, one of the best ways to do that is about alternative lifestyles. How do we then ensure that overconsumption in the north uh, that is leading to exploitation of natural resources in the south, uh, yes, we bring about a harmony uh, to try to reorganize that and so that we put people uh, first rather than profit first. Thank you. Thank you, Godwin. Um, then I will hand over to Marga. Please, please turn your microphone on. Sorry. Decolonization is a big, big word and also a big process. Uh, it demands a lot of practices and of undoing what we have constructed in a in, in, the, in a basis of an economical system that works uh, putting in the center the, the capital, the valorization of, the, of value, no? and, and uh, the use value, the concrete ways of the diversities are always pushed down. So I think this is the first act of colonial reason, and uh, this should be uh, deconstructed in the north and in the south also because the problem of development is that the south uh, ad acquires also this kind of vision of economic and just as 
Owen said now, um, the, the measures and the indicators and all this economy that is at certain point external to the communities and to the humanity and to our diversity. So I think the process of decolonization is a global process and it has to be entangled as, la uh, 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 as that. So I think Ime brought very clearly many questions about what we can, can uh, talk or pose like decolonize degrowth. Mm -hmm. So to, to decolonize degrowth, we have to bring uh, protagonism to actors that are struggling with growth and all the ide ideology that comes uh, from it. Um, so this is also, I, I think, a collaborative process. It's, it's, it's not only the South saying the North, but also the North um, speaking to themselves in a, in a very autocritical and reflexive way and making uh, uh, hearing uh, the notions of the South. Um, for example, I agree with the Ime when she said um, there's no uh, crisis that goes first because this is like an urgent question. No? So uh, the climate crisis or <clears throat> environmental, okay. But this is intertwined now with many other uh, um, uh, violences and subordinations and also imaginaries. It's very important what uh, um, uh, um, sorry um, Godwin said about um, create new narratives. So the new nar for example, and I see in the chat, does Africa can feed itself? Yes, and Latin America can feed itself. Yes. So this this kind of um, inter connections that always create a dependency and always create a kind of help that should come from the ones that already are there in the first world. So I think this whole narrative has to be deconstructed because we only have one world and it, 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 it has to be inhabitable for everybody. So I think this is the question of the decolonization. Um, I I don't know if I can address some of the public questions now or I I just wait for the next round Andy <laughs> We cannot hear you Thank you. I think it would be nice to give Imi and Alexander also the possibility to react on your presentations and to refer once again probably to decolonialization, degrowth and the current situation of solidarity or global solidarity in times of the pandemic. So uh, shall we start probably with Alexander because Imi had some problems uh, with the Wi-Fi and some technical issues. So we go on with you, Alexander, and we come later on to you, Amy. Please turn your mic on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I would start with a quote by uh, Antonio Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect optimism of the will. I think everybody knows this famous quote. We all see how uh, problematic and indeed catastrophic the situation is, has been for uh, decades, centuries, and is right now. We're right now in a very critical phase. But uh, all of us want to achieve um, solidarity. We want to work towards uh, global solidarity. So, um, in my talk, this is what I wanted to point out, and this is uh, why I only have a couple of questions to the other speakers whose inputs uh, I really liked a lot. For me, the question would be, uh, um, especially to Godwin and to Magara, uh, what forms of solidarity 
uh, you are wishing for what what so, so forms of solidarity you you want to achieve um what should be done right now and if the current situation that we're in right now is a window of opportunity is it for you a window of opportunity or not this is somehow <clears throat> Uh, I thought that uh, um, that th that is for for me important, and I'm uh, currently reflecting together with others uh, in, in order to find out uh, how how we can proceed in this very critical phase of of history right now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alexander. I think we're gonna uh, they're gonna respond to your question later on. Uh, first, I would like to give Imi the possibility to comment on the um, what she heard uh, from the other panelists and react on the question of decoloniality and degrowth and global solidarity in times of the pandemic crisis. But Imi is not around, so mm -hmm. she probably left. Um, she left the panel due to some technical issues. Then we go over and give the word to Marga and Godwin again, um, so that you can respond to the question of Alexander. Here, here I am. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alexander. I think I, I have a little bit of problem with the word solidarity. I think what we are looking now is more than solidarity. It's not like someone that solidarizes with something that is happening over there. I think it's, we, we have to uh, reveal the connections and the causalities and the, the problems in different regions and react to them in in a, in a network. Um, I think the word I prefer is like compromise or implication in uh, thinking that we are all sharing one only world in which we live and that what happens to them is happening to me. So in 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 the Italian movement I heard once this uh this other word about complicity. We must, we must be complicity one with another and feel that if someone in Mexico, we have in the, in the women's movement, we have this uh, slogan. If one is touched, if, if one woman is touched, everybody is touched. So, uh, it's like this kind of reaction that I think we have to start to forge. Ime, uh, speak about meaningful cooperations. I think this is very, very important. And I was saying in my first uh, talk that if something is happening, for example, in, in Mexico, in Oaxaca, and that implies um, Italian, um, Canadian or S Spanish um, corporations that are working over there, no, that are doing this, with the um with the approbation of the state or whatever we need to have these movements connected and how could uh, can we do that zapatista movement has been doing this in a global scale we have in the zapatista movement we have like this kind of global manifestations against something that is happening for example, in Mexico. So this should be like all over the world. And now we can do it because we have this, now I'm talking with you that are in, I don't know how many different place, uh, places at, at, the, at the same time. So we can do a lot of networking. We can first visibilize the causes of who are the companies and make a a, you know, a quilombo in the, in the, in the cities, in the, in the corporation physical space. No, we have to make presence there and say, you are doing that over there. And we are, we don't know, we don't agree. So I, I think this kind of, we have, we can do boycott. We can obstruct this kind of 
of things. So I think we have in, in a collaboration action, uh, program, a network, we can do a lot, a lot of things. Um, so they can also feel we are connected. So n not only that transnational corporations are connected all over the world. No, we all, we have to be connected and act like one in many, many spaces. So that's what I can elaborate. Thank you. Thank you also to be so critical um, when we are using the term solidarity and to reflect about this concept as well. I really like that. Um, I would also like to give you now, Godwin, the uh, opportunity to quickly respond on um, the question of Alexander, uh, because in, then we would like to go to the third part and the last part of our panel um, by referring to the questions which have been asked in the Q&A mode. So Godwin, you have to, you have to turn on your microphone, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Alex, for the questions. I think uh, my colleague who just spoke have answered most of the questions. Uh, uh, it's, it's not really an issue of solidarity the way we know it uh, in terms of cyber actions, um, petition writing and all that. Uh, this is far more than that. Uh, what is required, uh, which has a lot of problem also, uh, is is to think locally and act globally. Uh, I think that concept has been there. Uh, but uh, I, I struggle how the Southern movement will project to the global north and say decolonize your mental faculties in terms of development. Uh, so that in itself is against the current hegemonic capitalist system that promotes growth, promotes uh, profit before people. So I, I think this is a central element. How do we create a new narrative that take cognizance of the inequalities and the dire poverty that is massive on a global scale? So if you look at the geography of wet, uh, the wet uh, distribution in the world, you see a few corporations and countries are repository of, of, of this wealth. Uh, we cannot have that in a new world order. So we are asking first and foremost, how do we create through a narrative a new world order that does not depend on over extraction to feed over consumption. Uh, I think that is the first element that is coming out, which is very important. Um, we need collaboration, definitely. And this collaboration uh, have to move to the political arena. Uh, it's, it's not sufficient to have this kind of discourse, but we need to uh, analyze. We need to uh, gather these materials and use them as truth to speak to power. Uh, we need to be in the forefront to see that this transformation that we talk about is feasible. And the only way it can really work is to get into the mainstream of the government uh, and try to change things and push things around. So solidarity is always welcome. Uh, the question you ask is the moment we are in a window of opportunity. I think every moment is a window of opportunity. We have always been exploring these opportunities in the past, decades past, years past, and we'll continue to seize every opportunity to try to create a new narrative for a new world order. That new world order is emerging, but the narrative needs to be strengthened to understand that globally, the global citizens own the world resources and not a few. Mm -hmm. 
So thank you very much for answering the questions. Then I would like to go over to the third part of the session. I mean, about 10 minutes left only for our uh, panel debate. And uh, we will not be able to answer all the questions. However, I found one question very much related to what you said now. Uh, Godwin with regard to activism and Gabriel asked for instance everyone says degrowth needs to be decolonial how to achieve that so who wants to respond to that question and welcome again Imi to our panel debate we are in now in the section of Q&A's Marga. Maybe Ime, mm -hmm. maybe Ime should uh, talk a little bit <laughs> about this. She's still not really there. So let's go on and I will integrate her as soon as possible. Marga, do you have an answer to the question? So how yes. to achieve yes. um, decolonial um, future, uh, which is also a future based on degrowth? I think decolonial is a perspective of degrowth. I think if we decolonize our sense of good life in all of a, a turn to consumption, yeah, I'm speaking of subjectivities of individuals, but also I think, uh, and the yeah. pandemia is a good, a very good moment to to try to think about this, for example, if we think that we we don't have to live with with such a velocity, a speed of um, going from one place to another, if we don't have to use the airplanes as 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 we 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 just did before the pandemics, if we if we change a lot of how we think a good life is we are in a degrowth direction and we are also decolonizing our narratives our imaginary so i think this is this is one point the other point is as ime uh, brought uh, very clearly the protagonist of um of degrowth uh, proposals should open to uh to more narratives, to the pluriverse that we have in the world, to that diversity. And, and in order to do that, the growth has also to take in, in place, in charge, many other kinds of subordination. So the coloniality has to go with anti-capitalist uh, uh, positions uh, everywhere and all the time. I think, for example, I will put you an example of my own country, green uh, energy uh, in Oaxaca, in the center of, of my country in the south. The, the community said green energy that is privatized and co incorporated is not green energy. <laughs> green energy has to come from the bottom to the top with uh, a big discussion with the communal decisions. And so we are thinking about intertwining uh, 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 realities that are inter intertwined. So this is what I can mention. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. So another question which came up is from Marina um, and the question, I would like to ask the speakers what they what they think should be important priorities for the degrowth movement, which is at the movement very focused in Europe to establish to ensure a decolonial relation with the South. Um, Godwin, what do you say on that question? So how should, um, be, what should be the priority of the degrowth movement and how should a relation between the degrowth movement in Europe and the global south um, be established? So Godwin, can you hear me? 
please turn your mic on. <laughs> Godwin, please turn your mic Can on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, you, you posed the question and uh, I don't think I got it. Uh, the internet was wobbling at the time. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe again. The question is, uh, what, sh what do you think should be the priorities for the degrowth movement, which is at least focused in Europe, to establish and to ensure a decolonial relation with the South. Ima is back. <laughs> and welcome back, Ima. <laughs> Maybe she can take this question? I can try. I've been uh, like my I've had to use another browser and it's very slow. Sometimes it's breaking up a bit. Um, what should Sorry. be the focus you know, of, of degrowth? Mm -hmm. And it probably also related to that, we had also another question which is somehow relating to that. That means when we are thinking about, you know, how to build up a movement uh, or a degrowth movement which go far beyond Europe, the question also arises, what do whiteness as a concept, what role plays whiteness in shaping the idea of degrowth? And can the degrowth movement be decentralized? Okay, um, I think I will start by the first part. Um, I think right now, obviously, there's like millions, not even millions, billions of, of, of dollars and euros that are going to be spent um, and put into the economy, getting the economy um, started again. And I think what the degrowth movement can and should do at the moment is to see that if that money is spent, it is not put into... Um, you know, furthering the colonial project, basically. Um, and that is, that is a great, con a great concern. Um, and that is also where I think when I, when I entered the room again, there was uh, someone who was talking about um, energy democratization. I, I see that we only have a few minutes left. Um, and there's also a lot of, um, well, the, the Green New Deal almost has like an, an immaculate perception at the moment. Um, and in general, like decarbonization has an immaculate perception. I think um, that's where we need to basically focus and, and, sh and, and um, hold a lens basically on, on these um, projects and, and that are going to be enforced through these, with these monies, like for example, hydrogen power, which will uh, probably um, lead to large solar parks being built in West Africa and um, parts of South America. Um, I think that's that should be a focus of the degrowth moment at the degrowth at the moment. Uh, whiteness is of obviously at the center of all of the concepts coming from the global north, and I, I think it's um, the starting point is always to to see to examine it in the first place to reflect on it. Um, and to really um, listen to people from from the global south, especially, and, and people who've been racialized for for their opinion and um, for uh, um, you know for all of the like when when they're basically sounding the alarm um, to pay attention to that. I'm sorry, like you're you're sometimes um, flashing in and flashing out. I don't know if you even heard me. I'm a bit okay, but yeah. thank you very much, Imi, for um, yeah. yes, for your input. And sorry that we had a lot of uh, technical challenges in this panel. And now the time is running out, and there are a lot of questions uh, in the Q and A mode. And um, we have the possibility to continue the discussion in the Discord room, but we have to leave this chat forum and this is the reason why i say
thank you to all the panelists. You gave us a great talk and speech on degrowth, decoloniality and social movement activism and as well on global solidarity. Thank you very much for your contribution. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. And thank you also for all your effort. Um, and I would like to say thank you to all our listeners. It was really great that you um, listened to the different inputs and to the different talks. And if you want to continue with the discussion, we go on in the Discord room and there we can have the possibility to find some answer to the remaining questions. Then have a good evening and please enjoy the cultural program of this amazing conference and probably we will meet up in the Discord room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you.